All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of your Adrenal Fix, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about their health so that they can get their health back quickly. Really excited to meet with a colleague, uh, Sean Bean, who we are going to be talking about metabolic bottlenecking and thyroid and adrenals. Uh, Sean is an avid researcher. He's constantly in pursuit of deeper ways of looking at disease and chronic illness through the lenses of bio biochemistry, genetics, epigenetics, physiology. He's been dubbed the meta meta metabolic detective of integrative health. Oftentimes, he will be the last person to be seen. I can definitely identify with that after the people have exhausted every other therapy. I could go on and on, but Sean, I really want to just get into the meat and potatoes. So thank you so much for being here today. And Joel, it's a complete honor being with you because I've followed you for many, many years through my own journey. And a lot of your information has been paradigm and getting me to where I am today uh, yeah. in regards to um, back in the day, you were the adrenal guy, but we all know now that that whole methodology has changed and right. we're more of the, um, out-of-box thinkers were more of the, um, the technicians, you know, the people that put you on the diagnostics on the car and, you know, the people to see the big picture. Okay. I refer to this as the 40,000 foot view. Okay. <laughs> it's like being up an airplane and looking down rather than, you know, like many people are a specialist, you and I are specialists in being generalists. We're a generalized specialist. Okay. Right. So that's probably the easiest way I explain myself is what do you do? I'm a, I'm a specialist in being a generalist. Right. Awesome. Well, listen, I mean, that's very flattering to know, and I appreciate the the kind words. So I always like to know a little bit about your, and I do know so much, uh, somewhat of your personal story, um, but for the listeners that may not know, um, let's talk about how you became the generalist at, uh, at what you do. Um, about 20 years ago, I was a um, national book head of a bodybuilder. Uh, to make a long story short, we started the alter, alteration and circadian pattern. Uh, I read an article where bodybuilders were getting up at like three o'clock in the morning and go back to bed because I'm making, you know, more keep you in protein synthesis. And, you know, you know, we had a saying that you had to eat every two hours or you go catabolic. We know that to be a bunch of nonsense right now. Okay. There's a lot of myths out there that we had no idea about that were disproven. So what happened was I started getting up at three o'clock in the morning, eat my meal. Um, I read that article from Jay Cutler who eats like 12 times a day. And I was eating about 10 times a day my whole life was revived around feeding myself. I mean, the amount of calories I was eating, I was probably up around five, 600 grams of protein, 400 grams of carbs, and probably about 135 grams of fat to maintain my 225 pound, you know, four to 5% body fat composition. Because being, an, being a mesomorph, we had to eat calories. Plus I had a fast metabolism uh, and I rarely ever did cardio. So, um, <clears throat> What happened there was, is because of the circadian pattern, I started to have sleep disturbances. I started having immune cellulogical dysfunctions and there were warning signs before I even went into contest time. So um, after we get done contest, um, we went and decided to have sushi. So being stressed, my immune system was compromised. We, just, we were at the sushi bar for about five hours. I think I put on between 15, 20 pounds of water weight um, in, in that time frame. Cause you, after the contest, you get done you can literally see yourself growing. Um, you know, it was insane because of the water retention. And then I started to feel a little icky afterwards. And I'm like, uh, and then I started having malabsorption problems. I went to the doc, you know, the whole story. Go doctor, GI doctor, nothing's wrong. You know, it's like you got this guy coming to your office now that was like 185 pounds. And then, you know, six weeks later at 240 pounds, you know, the first thing out of their mouth was steroids. I'm like, dude, I haven't touched that stuff in years prior before this stuff happened. So we can't, can't go down that rabbit hole. Okay. And they always want it. So I walked in the doctor's office. They text my testosterone, came back 35 total. 35 total, which now we know is basically what we call a eunuch, which is basically castration level. Um, no known explanation. So he gave me like five milligrams of androgel, which we knew was total joke, did nothing. So I started to look at my labs. I started to know the alkaline phosphatase was low. I brought this up to his attention. He didn't recognize it. I started to notice my thyroid was off, even though it was in the normal range. But, you know, the, the basic stuff that we know now, we're like, well, this is what's going on. But back then they had no clue. So fast forward, um, I had GI problems. And then once that happened, I moved into a house with mold in it. And then 
<laughs> about a month after moving into the house of mold, um, I suspected the parasite. And actually two years later, I found out the place I ate sushi got closed down by the health board for preparation of food. So I was correct about that. But then I went into a house with mold be, um, as a, a chaperone to a person that had, um, um, he was cerebral palsy. My mom started cleaning the house. She didn't tell me 15 years later. Oh, by the way, there was black mold there. So about a month in, I woke up with total amnesia. I didn't know who I was, stuttering, slobbering. I was a stranger in a strange land. And that's when my whole life changed. Um, and we started down these rabbit holes. Um, the doctors, you know, you're, oh, you're, you're, you know, they put you on thyroid medicine. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, your thyroid levels are beautiful and you're still feeling like crap. And here I was, you know, I had lost over 90 pounds of lean muscle tissue, even eating a lot of calories. So there was major malabsorption issues going on. So we went down that rabbit hole. Then they tested my adrenals. Then they said, I don't even know how you're walking around. Um, my, total, my total cortisol levels were at, um, my total cortisol levels were at um, two on the serum. So therefore, um, I was clinically um, quote Addison's, borderline Addison's, but it wasn't able to do anything. So in that scenario, what happened was, is then I went through and I'm like, doc, find out what I'm deficient and put it back in because of the malabsorption issue. And that was what I originally started with anyway in the first place, um, because that threw me off. Because I knew I was deficient in thing, everything. You know, I wasn't absorbing. Like I said, I lost a hundred. They said if I was, wasn't as big as I was, I would have been dead. Because the, um, I went from 235 pounds at a low percent body fat down to 165 pounds at like 14% body fat in less than nine months. So there was a lot of things going on there. So um, this led into another, then this led me down the rabbit hole of heavy metals. I think the biggest thing that helped me was what was known as PK protocol. And the PK protocol was the phospholipid IVs with the methyl B12 and the methyl folate together. That helped out tremendously. Within six weeks, I had gained most of my strength back getting back into the, the normal swing of things. I walked back in the gym, you know, six weeks later, they thought I had AIDS and here I was back almost 75% of my own strength. Now that led into, um, I was doing really good, always back on things. And then um, I got hit with fluoroquine loans because I was going after my gut. I knew my gut was still off. So I decided to have a, a parasite test. Parasite test came back. The parasite test came back with uh, an organism. Um, the drug they recommended was um, genomycin. I went to the pharmacist. Um, they gave me a drug. They gave me Levoquin instead um, because it was a replacement for genomycin. And then I took three days of that. I felt like my rip, I felt like I was going to rip muscles right off. And that's when my GI tract just like never healed. And after that, then it just started into like one episode of mold right after another, making me more susceptible. And then um, just within the past four years, I got a bad mold hit and I had to go through it all again. But my knowledge base was much stronger. But the difference was, is we did not have electromagnetic fields 20 years ago. So the electromagnetic fields made the biggest impact on my recovery. And when we moved out of the house with mold, which was great, I felt good. But the thing is, we moved into a condo which was basically right by the, um, you know, with 35 Wi-Fi's going. And here I was trying to get, you know, push my way through, and then we had a gas stove. So you had the overload of the phenol pathway going, and the overload of the phenol pathway, I started to notice little white spots coming up. And we're starting to see this more in people that have COVID too. We're starting to see these little white dots come up with no known explanation. Um, upon clinical research, I found an article showing that they were actually phenols coming out through your skin as a result of the inability to break it down, which I do have a phenol sulfur transferase issue going on, which I have to do with salt 2A1, multiple salt 2A1 genes. So as you can see the patterns going on. So this is where I'm at today, um, recovering from another mold hit and I wax and wane. When I get a mold hit, what happens is, is it hits my dopamine receptors, hit my acetylcholine receptors. I can go from the Parkinsonian to, uh, to uh, 
the MG, um, Mastivis, uh, myo, I can never pronounce that word. Um, but you go into the acetylcholine uh, deficiency. So there are come times where, you know, I might wake up stuttering. I may have um, plus being an Asperger's. I noticed that the mold making my Asperger's symptoms 10 times worse. I'll go into an anodonic state. I'll go into a locked up syndrome state, as they would call it. I would go into, um, all right, go ahead. Okay. Um, I would go into locked up syndrome, makes you know relationships difficult, communications. So you see a lot of people that have um, like mold toxicities in a lot of cases that I'm sure you worked on and I worked on and many practitioners work on. When you get that mold taken care of, a lot of the Asperger's, a lot of the autistic symptoms go away. And um, we do see that a lot. And there have been clinical studies shown that um, Dr. Um, Andrew Campbell, who runs, who's the editor and director of, um, medical director of My Micro Labs, has seen and documented this on multiple times when you address the underlying factor, which is the mycotoxins and the mold. A lot of these Lyme symptoms and MS and all these other quote labels get better. And I can attest to that um, because when I do address my metabolic pathways that are associated with the mycotoxins, specific ones, I have gliotoxins and I have Don. Uh, and that explains when I look into the chemical research of what they do, Don mimics celiac. And I've been basically living as a celiac and also a cystic fibrosis um, for many, many years because on my organic acid test, I always kept seeing the elevated of 10 hippuric. And often we see 10 hippuric high. The funny thing is, is I always tell people, I always tell my clients, I said, I bet your SHBG is high. They come back, they're like, how'd you know? I said, your hippuric is high. That's usually an indication that there's damage to the liver on your phase one and phase two. And that usually means your sulfation pathways off. Um, and as you know, I'm a specialist in hormones and endocrine system um, in regards to a lot of the protocols out there with male hormones actually originated from my um, findings that were taken you know, by other doctors because I was not a medical doctor. And as a um, current trends that we're seeing, and one of the things was, is I was always the one when you look on my, um, you know, on my Facebook, I'm always talking about SHBG, the clinical relevance of it. Why is it so high? Um, there have been a very few cases and I've been one of them that have been actually been able to lower it from high back down to my normal. And I believe that one of the reasons was, is that I was, I was having protein malabsorption and the protein malabsorption was also coming from the Don because what happens is protein malabsorption, Don will mimic celiac, which will shorten your villi. When you shorten your villi, what happens is you'll develop protein synthesis issue. So the thing that I did was, is I looked at the clinical research and how could I increase my protein synthesis despite using digestive enzymes and the HCL and bitters and yada, 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 which did nothing, okay, for my SHBG. So the two things I found that worked for HHB, SHBG was, number one, it wasn't treating the mold. Number two, um, it was actually the things that I did through there. I did two things. The only thing I could figure it out was I started glutathione injections because transdermally, I can't transdermal, transdermal or injections are the only two things that work because I've tried every liposomal under the sun. The, people with um, gallbladder issues, people with um, mimicking cystic fibrosis, they don't absorb liposomes because there's gallbladder issues. Okay, so I don't even take that chance no more. And it was the same thing with um, a lot of my supplements. So I either go transdermally or I injected. I, you know, nasal, up the rear, whatever I can do to get it in, okay? And doing the injections was a huge asset because I could do the injections three times a week. I made sure I could recycle it. Now, the only thing you have to watch with the, um, with the glutathione injections is you have to make sure that the, um, you don't have a high gliotoxin because in clinical research, if you have gliotoxin, there's a potential chance that the glutathione can potentially feed it itself because it does work off the disulfide pathway uh, that I did find out. Uh, it's, 
it's a complex um, it's a complex uh, sequence of events, but I've I actually have it mapped out on different clinical research um, with that that I can potentially share with you um, in the studies. But using the glutathione um, in my case and a few other cases worked wonderful. But the problem was is after three or four months we started to get negative effects from it, and we suspected that it was helping the inflammation, the gliotoxin, but on the end, other end, what it was doing was, was also potentially feeding it. And in one case where I had, we did glutathione um, acetylcholine, or we used the S-acetylglutathione. And what happened was we had this kid um, back to fully functional. And I believe he grew like three to four inches within six months. It was insane. Um, but it was like his father's back, you know, my son's back, but then he fell down again. Okay. And guess what we found inside his mycotoxin test, gliotoxin. So proper analysis of the labs is crucial because you have to know what pathways are being affected. Gliotoxin also works on leukotrienes, the B4 pathway, you know, very similar to aspirin. So if you have a slice like problem, Salicylates will inhibit the leukotriene response from that pathway. So giving things like fish oils is counterproductive in those scenarios. So, um, so anything that shuts that down, you wanna be careful of, because you wanna stimulate it. Because if that leuk, what happens is the gliotoxin shuts that pathway down. And when it shuts it down, it can't respond to other infections. So your immune system gets knocked out as a response to that. So different organisms, the fungus is the gun, the mycotoxin is the bullet, okay? And the thing is, is with mycotoxins, it doesn't matter whether it's candida, fungal, yeast, whatever. The end products are usually similar to alcohol. That's why when I start treating my client, I'm not treating, but when advising my clients and recommendations, they are based upon three different criteria that I'm starting to find out. Pellegra, which is from an alcohol. Number two, alcohol or non-alcoholic fatty liver. And three, traumatic brain injury. When you start to adjust those things from those angles and reverse engineer the microbiome, the endocrine system, the nutritional deficiencies, the environmental toxins, the brain, then you'll start to see how everything connects together. And it's this connection that majority of practitioners are missing because they are a specialist. Go to a mold specialist, they focus on mold. They give you a Schumacher protocol. So a Schumacher protocol is good for some people, but if you have low cholesterol, you can't do cholestyramine. Why do you have low cholesterol? Because aspergillus penicillium is guess what? A statin. So basically in my line, in my biochemistry, I have been living with a person that has been poisoned by statins, poisoned by fluoroquinolones, an alcoholic, living with cystic fibrosis, and also a celiac all together. So what I did was, is I looked at the pathologies of those conditions and reverse engineer them through the metabolic pathways and the gene expressions to better understand a lot of the chronic illnesses that we deal with, which actually has a very similarity to autism. Because I've got into this study in autism because of somebody on the, you know, somebody on the online who said, have you ever thought about you being autistic? Well, that makes sense because, you know, 35, you know, when we were growing up, okay, we had people, you're shy, okay? Shy was a form of depression. I had classical signs of Asperger's back then. I was extremely highly intelligent, but I had dyslexia. I could count and do mathematical explanations, never carry a book to school. I would fall asleep in class, wake up, answer the question, go back to sleep. And I even got to the point to where the, the Teachers thought I was cheating because I never did my, I rarely did my homework. 
I didn't do things to completions, but I fulfilled all the criteria. And I was one of the few students that has ever gone from the bottom end of the learning class because they always put you in categories based upon, you know, reading because you're always reading low, then you're going to be science low and this low. Well, I was the only student in my uh, class that jumped from low science up to the um, gifted class. And I was outscoring the valid, I was actually out doing the valedictorians because of my science background. <laughs> and because what happened was, is we had the SATs back then and the SATs were indication of how smart you are. Well, that's not so true because, because I had a learning disability, I was scoring 700 on the SATs because of the time strain. And the problem was, is how the questions were asked was, I was trying to take something simple and turn it into, into something that was rocket science. And I was never, my brain didn't work that way. So one of the gifts that I have as a clinician is, is I have this holographic viewpoint where I can take a case, look at the labs, break them down scientifically in the metabolic pathways, the gene expressions, and then actually formulate the regimen based upon all the criteria, but also the um, contraindications based upon the um, hidden factors. Like for example, it's like people are taking quercetin. They don't understand quercetin downstream, the alcohol dehydrogenase pathway actually backlogs into the NAT pathway. So if you have fatty liver and you have an alcohol or mycotoxins, the alcohol dehydrogenase pathway is going to get overloaded. And then the NAT pathway, the nl transferase pathway is going to get overloaded. So that's where your B5, B1 molybdenum comes in. But if you get quercetin, quercetin inhibits that. So therefore you're gonna have problems with um, phenol issues, salicylate issues, and that phenol sulfur transferase pathway is gonna get overloaded again, which a lot of people have. And you can look at the phenol sulfur transferase pathway by just looking at the Dutch test, just looking at the organic acid test, they cross-reference each other. So if you see number 61 high and number 10 high, and then you see on the Dutch test, you see the DHA um, say at 12 o'clock and you see the DHAS at nine o'clock, that's a sulfation pathway problem. And then what you do is, is you go back on and look at your genetics and boom, there it is. Salt 2A1, 2A2, red. So what I do is, is I've learned to, number one, the genetics is a map. It's not an absolute. So I know this sounds against current trend, but that's what I do. I'm a renegade. I go against current trend. I don't look at genetics anymore. I don't need it. You, as a clinician, I've learned to reverse engineer this to know exactly what genes are expressing based upon symptoms, based upon lab testing results. The organic acid test does over 16 different gene expressions. I figured out. And then when you look at erotic acid, that erotic acid is only ammonia if it's high. And second of all, if it's low, it's actually phosphatidylcholine in an indication of um, PEMT gene expression. So if the female comes in, I see low erotic acid on the organic acid test, which is number 60. I'm like, I bet your estrogen levels are low. And then boom, what do we do? We do an estrogen test. There they are. So and therefore, they're, you know, at a person who was, um, she had a hysterectomy 15 years ago. Her doctor only gave her progesterone only. She had gained 150 pounds. We did an organic acid test. We saw her levels were low. I said, let me add, you know, she's like, there's no medical doctor around here. I said, listen, I'll find you one. If I don't find you one, there's things that we can do over the counter. So we used um, an over the counter estradiol just to balance it out. So if you're at progesterone where it is and let's just balance it out, okay? Because their philosophy is, oh, you have one ovary, okay? She had a partial hysterectomy. Oh yeah, partial of your, you have part of your ovary, you'd be perfectly fine, okay? I'm sure you hear it all the time in that scenario. And what did we do? We gave her a little bit of estrogen. She slept for the first time in 15 years. After six weeks, she had lost 15, 20 pounds. She goes, Sean, 
I want to fly up there and give you a hug and kiss. I said, Did you say a little estrogen, sorry to interrupt, like five milligrams. What are you talking about? Um, what we did was, is I usually run um, two point, I use a run between uh, one to two of biased because estradiol will break down into the different metabolites. And this is where I like get like ruffled because they'll come in on estradiol when we measure their metabolic pathways, they're going toward the four hydroxyesterone, they're going to the two hydroxyesterone, they're going down the different pathways when they also have a history of breast or uterine or ovarian cancer, okay? So the other pathways are not being addressed. So what I tend to do is, is I wanna look not just upstream, downstream, but side stream, just to make sure the recommendations are adequate for their person. Cause you know, here you are, you know, I had one case of a woman who had advanced cancer. She, she went on a plantarian based diet, okay? What happened was she went to alkaline. So when she went to alkaline, her body started producing acid against it. So the tumor started growing even faster because she went on a um, you know, plantarian diet, only eat plants. In her, in her case, it was counterproductive. I said, listen, we need to put more acid in your system because your body is trying to produce acid to offset the alkalinity. You know, we did, and guess what happened? The cancer tumor slowed because just because it's in the literature, there are always going to be exceptions to the rule. There's always going to be, you know, research is not, it's PubMed is not the Bible. And the PubMed, it's like you have, it looks at one factor. It doesn't look at the, all the other factors, okay? Like testosterone, how it said testosterone was dangerous. Well, if you look at the population that that, that article was revoked, that was re um, retracted, because the population they did the studies on was vets with post-traumatic um, stress syndrome from the war. No wonder it caused, you know, they come up with testosterone causes cardiovascular disease in older men. Why? Because they know testosterone heals. So that study was completely false. Yeah, I, I find that there's a paradox with studies because, you know, I'm trained as a licensed chiropractic physician and I've done functional medicine and nutrigenomics and researching the whole medical curriculum. They put high emphasis and I got to give praise to to peer reviewed studies, to be able to validate and have scientific data. So there's a hot, huge emphasis on it. But then you in what you've just said, Sean, with the the gaming of the results or the unbiased the biased sample sizes or the samples or the dependent variables and independent variables of what they want to results to show or if it's not significant above and beyond a control or placebo they can really gamify the the results um, to to dictate what the pharmaceutical approach will be and they end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I think. But so many things that I, I, I would love to address, um, and I, I could probably get you on a part two, because I'm really interested to know about the phenol sulfation tie-in, because um, I think that's a lot of areas where just it's uncharted water for a lot of uh, those in the know, let alone those that aren't in the know. And uh, I'd love to get your insight on that. But let, back to your original story and then how you got into what you got into. Um, I, I guess it's, it's a blessing if you look at it as you had to go through all of those trials and tribulations and background experiences in order to not only heal yourself, but to be a healer to other people as well. And um, with that being said, uh, now you have an approach where people come to see you and you look for where those metabolic bottlenecks are. So I guess maybe if we can succinctly explain when someone comes to you, uh, how, how, how are you putting weight on how you're figuring out where those bottlenecks are? Because I know you're a big proponent of the limbic center wind up and how much the autonomic nervous system revs the the battery, if you will, no matter what's going on metabolically with those bottlenecks. And then of course, there's their own subjective feedback and what they feel is working and not working. 
then most importantly is the objective numbers that are telling us the story and then knowing the genomics and the map and the blueprint, which I would agree with in the sense that it, it really gives you an idea how those pathways work and reverse engineering what needs to be done environmentally, nutritionally, mindset wise, limbically to be able to, to come up with a game plan. Um, I guess the question is, Sean, how do you how do you balance all of those variables to be able to unlock those metabolic bottlenecks? What I've come down to is is um, I mean I mean teaching this to other clinicians is use the minimal testing necessary, okay? Like it depends on economics. People come into me and yourself included with like these mounds of labs, right? The number one thing we that you and I both know is is the answer is there, okay? And the old saying is, listen to the patient, they tell, tell your diagnosis. And that's so true, but unfortunately, a lot of clinicians, you know, have their eyes set on one thing. Um, so, you know, you come in, like, person comes in with Hajimoto's because they're coming from the stop the thyroid madness. And the next thing you know, it's like, they're leading you down this rabbit hole when it's like, by the way, tell me about your relationship, you know? And then you find out that that person has been you know, has for whatever reason has been sexually abused by bosses and, you know, had male problems. And like, you're, you know, you're pointing the rabbit down the wrong hole here. Okay. You think healing your thyroids? No, I said, you need to go see a counselor. So number one, taking detailed history is crucial. Okay. And just listening. Usually within the first 15 minutes, it's like, they give you the mound, you know, it's like, Listen, I don't need to see that you have Bartonella, this, that. I just, do you have Lyme? Yes or no. What do you have in your past? Okay. If we know it's there, then that's great. But then it's like, you get going and it's like, I've been treated for Lyme. I've been treated for this. I've been treated for that. Then all of a sudden, it's like, you would start asking, him, said, so tell me about your house. Well, we had a leak. And then you start going back to the history. Then you're like, then you start to see the symptoms get worse about six months later. And it's like, have you been checked for mold or fungus or anything like fungal? They're like, no. I said, you went to a Lyme doctor, right? Yeah. I said, do you understand that mycotoxins cross react with antibodies to Lyme and Epstein Barr and cytomegalia? So if you have um, cross reactivity from mycotoxins, guess what? Until you address the underlying cause, all those other factors aren't going to work. Okay. You're just pouring water into the bucket that has holes in it. So basically what I do when a client comes in is take a detailed history and try to find out what supplement, you know, biggest, as a clinician, the best advice I can give another clinician, ask them what treatments worked in the past and what hasn't. And that will lead you to potential pathways that are being disrupted. If those pathways are disrupted, then you know the potential causes of what those pathways are linked back to, okay? And if you are, and if clinicians are not sure, um, Dr. Ben Lynch does a wonderful job on his pathway planner showing you where, showing the pathways of what inhibits it. Or you can go through PubMed. And that's how I learn is I didn't learn through reading, you know, Dr. Google. I learned it from thousands and thousands and thousands of hours looking at studies on rats because the reason being is there's no political gain in those and actually the rats studies their their functionality not their actuality links to humans a lot and hey, Sean, can, i'm sorry to interrupt i wanted to give a good um comment on one of the things you mentioned and ask your insight on this um, a lot of people will, um, with asking them, hey, what worked, what didn't work, and, and then putting a protocol together and seeing that whatever you did made them worse, maybe make a comment on the utility of that, because I think a lot of people end up just stirring up their limbic center and going into overdrive mm -hmm. again with their with what you did that stimulated this response that can, it's only results, you know, you don't want to put emotion on those results. And it, when it stimulates a response that's thought of as negative, it's actually very, very helpful for the clinician 
more so than if nothing happened whatsoever and maybe even a little bit with there's just a little bit but i'm not sure um how important that information is number one and number two um how important it is for that person to not let that negative result or that perceived negative result along with perceived negative results in blood testing. Cause I see this all the time with my patient base is they get a test back and I'm always hes hesitant to send it to them before we've met because they have this whole story in their head of, Oh my God, it's getting worse. I can't believe it. And then the things that we're doing might make them uh, temporarily uh, more inflamed or temporarily kicking up the ocean floor because you're you're turning on pathways that have had challenges with. So I guess the question is, how important is it for both the clinician and the patient alike to understand that this is it this is is really a hypothesis of of physiology and and there's lots of forty thousand view foot moving parts, and you really have to um, think of it as, non-emotional information versus um, anything else. I think the best piece of advice there is, is, is this is what I tell a client. I said, listen, it's not the fact that you have all these things. It's the fact that when you don't have all these things that I'm concerned, okay? And when I tell them, I said, look at all these imbalances, these help explain a lot of your symptoms. This is good news, okay? When it comes back and there's nothing, that's when I start to worry. And when you do that, what that does is that puts them at ease, okay? Because that way, oh my God, look what's wrong with me. You have to change the mentality and said, look, what's wrong with you is explaining what's going on. So don't look at it as a bad thing, look at it as a good thing. And it's the, as I mentioned before, it's what I don't see that concerns me. And there have been, probably four cases out of the thousand that I dealt with that I went to the doctors and I said, listen, I cannot give any kind of medical justification for what this person is, is, is feeling. Okay. And, and I gave them benefit of the doubt, the reverse T3, this, you know, I gave them opti the optimization. And I said, listen, this needs to be referred out to, I feel that this case needs to be referred out to a psychiatrist. And guess what they come back with? Munchausen's. Again, there was only three cases out of the several thousands. But what happens, just curious, what happens though when you want to implement something that you've pretty much narrowed down to this pathway or that pathway and you implement that strategy and there might be a short uh, glitch or there might be a little bit of a response. Okay. Um, how, how do you damage control, I guess, or what do you do from there? Yeah. First of all, one of the things I do is, is when I make recommendations, I always tell them, said, listen, by using this supplement, we may be stressing this pathway. And these are the things you may experience. And I think having that in-depth knowledge, such as yourself and other practitioners, taking that extra you know, a minute to explain them will put them at ease, you know, and you don't want, and some people, you know, that are buyer hackers, they want to go down that rabbit hole. You know, if you give this, this happens. Like, listen, I said, listen, you have a comp gene expression. Quercetin can sometimes impact the comp to some degree. So these are some of the symptoms you might experience because, you know, you're not breaking down your adrenaline properly. Okay. And as a result, we can offset that. If your adrenaline goes up, these are some things that you can do, you know, use Botswellia or maybe use theanine or work on that GABA system and work on the braking system. Okay. To try to pull you out of it. Because um, one of the things I found I use as a rescue remedy is bots, um, frankincense. Frankincense has been a rescue remedy because it kind of like quells the inflammation, like right there. Without without any other side effects or any without other any, without any other side effects, right? Um, that's one of the things I found. Lavender may be another one, but with Botswellia, you know, people I'm reacting to this oil, that oil. Then we know that they have a phenolytic acid, they have a phenol issue, they have a phenol sulfur transferase issue, they have a salicylate issue. So then you have to work from that. You know, then you have to work from that angle. Then maybe use Botswellia um, internally with a capsule 
rather than coming through an essential oil. Um, because and you start very, very slow, like no dose is low enough before you start to notice a response. Is that your philosophy as to slow and low or just try to get right in that bell-shaped curve right away? What, what's your philosophy on that? You always want to have a buffering system in place before you start to add the gas pedal. I always try to uh, isolate the potential variables because you're never going to get all of them, but you can somewhat you know, prep them. Like maybe they're, I said, listen, one of the, one of the things we're going to help you with is how about we help you better tolerate stress? Okay. So then we work on the, you know, we work on them. That's why I like clinical documentation. So where you have an organic acid test, you have a little bit what's going on in the playing field. It's not like you're digging. It's not like you're digging on, um, you know, you're trying to break ground for a new building and you're digging and you find stones where you go in blind it and you buy it, you buy a, um, a plot that had, they had no idea that was built over top of a garage, you know, tires, or you don't know what you're getting yourself into. So clinical testing is, you know, one of the things I advocate because I like to see who the enemy is. I like to see how can we litigate any of these potential issues, you know, like, if a person's anodonic, it's like you may want you may not want to give CBD oil because if you give CBD oil in an anodonic person, it can make them more anodonic because they're on the dopamine pathway, even though that they have a flare up. Or how many times you've seen people that were schizophrenic, they give you um, they go after the dopamine pathway when the schizophrenia was actually from the glutamate pathway. So that's it, with medications too, right? Like all of these SSRIs, they're in the, I've always said they're in the wrong, they're in the <laughs> wrong arena. They're right? in the wrong arena. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if you do like an organic acid test, you have somewhat of an indication of who you're dealing with. You're not going in blind. I mean, I always tell people, I, you know, when people come to me and said, let's stop playing guessing games and put the nail in the coffin. Okay. You've been dealing with this too long, okay? There is about four simple tests that I utilize. And once we know what's going on there, then we know. It's like one of the biggest tests I use is the um, Omega Quant. I was, you know what? I was going to ask you when you started to talk about it. I, I wrote it down here. When you started to talk about the leukotrienes and the B4, if you're doing the Omega Quant. So maybe tell the listeners um, what the Omega Quant is. Yeah. The Omega Quant has been the... I always tell my clients, I said, this will be the best hundred dollars you'll ever spend. Because if you don't stabilize the PG1, PG2, and PG3, and you don't know those hidden fires that are going on, okay? People come with client, line, mold, EBV, this, that, and everything in the, you know, in the kitchen sink, failing treatment. You do, and you find out that the arachidonic acid levels are 42. I said, you know, those three or four fuels to the fire, multiply by a factor of 10. Okay. Right. Because you can see, or you see a person with, um, you see a person with HA1C of like 5.3, but then you do a red blood cell test and you see that the arachidonic acid levels are, the ratio is 30 to one. Off the charts. It's not even showing on the, on it's the, not, uh, it's, I mean, four to seven yeah. is my goal. Okay. Four to seven is my goal. There are certain labs I don't like because they don't follow um, clinical criteria. Um, some of the ranges go from like 12 to like 125. I'm right. like, give me a break, you know? And I ran them side by side and they're pretty close. But if the laboratories are giving that information to clinician, they're prime for, they're prime false information. Yeah. Why you, curious, curious, sorry to interrupt you. As have you been pairing that with the inflammation test that looks at thromboxane levels as well or are you just doing it on its own i'm kind of just doing it on its own and we find out that you know the arachidonic and sometimes the arachidonic acid is is you know you may not use fish oils you may want to use things that inhibit the leukotriene pathway okay are you going right to spms or you are um more so i'll go to like um botswellia frankincense frankincense right. Will inhibit that pathway, then that pathway blocks up into the phenyl sulfur transferase pathway too. So the phenols actually trigger the leukotrienes. 
So it's so interesting because that's a, a sort of a newer pathway that I've sort of added to the whole it's, layer. It's, of, yeah. That pathway is the COVID pathway. Right. And that's how I've been addressing COVID. There is a, a wonderful um, practitioner, his name's Doug Kaufman. He's been dealing with mycotoxins and mycotoxosis for 35 years. And he said the same thing. You treat, COVID is coming and when you treat them with antifungals, they're getting better. The long haulers. And that's how I, that's how I address them. I address every person coming in as, you know, once I find, because as I mentioned before, COVID hits, drops the secretory IgA, your bifidobacterium levels go down, that opens up the door to any of the pre-existing infections or exposures that you may have to mycotoxins. We know through clinical research that at least 43%, up to 50% or more of the buildings have in the United States have been or have water damage. Okay, so your immune system was able to keep it in check. Now, since this COVID does, it unleashed the monster that your body's been keeping in and it's releasing these viruses and activating these lines. I've had cases that people had water damage 15 years ago. Right. When we look at it, I'm like, you had it all the time, but your body was just keeping in check. Your immune system was keeping the lock on the cage. Now the monster is out. Okay. So you like you like the organic acid, the omega check, the Dutch, and there's a fourth one that you're doing, or if there is um, clinical evidence of the you know water damage done, then I'll go to the My Michael Labs. The My Michael Labs is a blood test. It's the one that's a peer reviewed article. It's based upon clinical evidence. Um, there has been controversy on the or urinary test that you'd have to take multiple samples throughout the day to get something experience, to get a clinical uh, documentation because mycotoxins are, you know, wax and wing. But if it's in the blood, you can't, you can't refute that, okay? It's there, you know? And it's like, same way you, and it's like, mycotoxins are like one-tenth of a micron which are the size of viruses. When was the last time that you used a urine test to look to see you have EBV, right? And this, when you start talking like this, it's like, oh, wow, that makes sense. You know, I'm not disputing the fact that there could be clinical relevance to it, but I have shifted. And the reason being was, is if you have a glutathione deficiency, if you have um, an oxidative stress issue, you can't get it out. It's trapped in the tissue. So if you use the blood, you don't need to do the post you don't need to put that person at risk of doing a glutathione challenge. Okay. Yeah. I've had people that have been sent to the hospital as a result of that. You mean as a as a um, a challenged uh, mycotoxin test? Is your you're, you're doing a yes. challenge? Well, yeah. If you know that the person can't recycle glutathione and you give them glutathione, what's going to happen? You're going to have a paradoxical effect. You're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a, a major herx. If that person has adrenal insufficiency on top of it, you could have an adrenal crisis on your hands. So by using the blood, you don't have to do provocational tests. You don't have to do a sauna. You don't have to do anything. You just go get blood done. And then not only does that is, it tells you what we're reacting to. So if you come up negative on the IgG, but then you light up like a Christmas tree on the IgE, then you know you're dealing with mast cell. Where on a urine test, you don't know if you're having a, a, an immune response or um, a mast cell response from it. So if you know that you have a gliotoxin that has a mast cell response, then you know if you go after the gliotoxin, you have to support that. I have a couple of people right now that have gliotoxin. I moved them uh, to Singular because what Singular does is Singular is used and guess what? Acid or aspirin, aspirin poisoning. So if we know that the phenosulfur transferase pathway is overloaded, you know there could be a high salicylate issue. 
So if it's salicylate is an issue, then they use the singular to offset. And the problem is, is that's why people don't respond to antihistamines. The problem is not the histamines, it's leukotrienes that they're responding to. Yeah, I got, I got all these notes, Sean, and I, I want to be respectful for our time. Um, I, got a, I got actually another appointment coming up here, but if you'd be willing to do a part two, because I got sure. so much more questions to ask you, I definitely want to go down the rabbit hole, hole of the phenol sulfur pathways and um, talking about just the, the additional layers of the unbottlenecking and, and just go a little bit further down these rabbit holes. I'd love to have you back. So um, I'll save that parting question till we meet again. But I guess a good parting question might be, let's say someone's listening to this and it, it is getting somewhat sophisticated. And I do feel like a lot of the people we see have had to become sophisticated because their doctors haven't done the work for them. And they're right up in the pilot seat helping to fly the plane. But with that being said, um, what do you think with everything that you've said so far in maybe less than five minutes is the best recommendation you can give to someone who's listening to this that thinks, you know what, it's insurmountable. I, I can't overcome this. I'm never going to meet with a Sean or a Joel. And I, I don't, my doctors don't understand this. What would be the best advice you would give to them to give them a head start on, on their recovery process? First thing I would do in that scenario is assess your environment. Assess your environment, work on your water intake. Uh, if you're drinking out of plastic bottles, do the simple things first, the foundational work, okay? Get out in the sun. Without sun, you don't create sulfate. Without um, proper diet, you know, go organic the best you can. Um, the other thing is, is the thoughts we think, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. And also get around a community that is going to support you. Get around a community that is, you know, a phone call away to have that support. One of the things that we run into as clinicians and also individuals is lack of community support or family support. And without that family support and community, it's gonna make the survival. And also, if you do find a clinician, find a clinician that merges with you, okay? That you click with. If you're not getting the right vibes for them, don't waste time, okay? You'll know right off the bat. And, you know, I find a clinician that is more, you know, we need Lyme specialists, we need traditional medicine, but find one that looks at the bigger picture, okay? Not just, oh, genetics or this, that, and everything. It, uh, it's amazing, too, because as sophisticated and technical and... 30, 40,000 view foot intricacies that are going on here. At the end of the day, no matter what, no matter how good your protocol is or your built protocol specifically for them, that's ever dynamically changing, if you would use the word protocol, um, is the fact that all of the things you just said will not, all the things that you identified will not work if you don't do the things you just said. Right. Which is which is amazing because that's where you say, well, we got to get to the psychologist or psychiatrist to figure out what's going on here, because at the end of the day, we've identified what's wrong. We're not missing a magic pill or a magic supplement or a magic test. There's these other things that you're missing that you're not doing that are free and um, mm -hmm. they're not always easy. Right. No. And. Everybody's trying to look for that magic pill, that magic bottle, that magic practitioner, the person who is in limelights, okay, has the biggest website, has the fanciest TikTok or whatever. And sometimes it could be fine that little natural path that was shoved in the corner on a mom pa type shop that just has this basic knowledge that has been profound. You know, maybe just one of my severe Lyme, severe mold, Canada. Winter time, go to the tanning salon three times a week. What happens? I said your MSH is down, your antidiuretic hormones down. Seventy percent of her symptoms got better. That was because she was lacking sunlight, right. and that turned on the mitochondria and started the whole process. But it jump started her. So as a clinician, we just want to, you know, I have a love hate relationship with functional medicine. Personally, I think a lot of practitioners do a good job. But I think a lot of times they're turning molehills into mountains. 
where we should be turning mountains into molehills. That's and great. I think that's one of the biggest things I see um, in functional medicine going today is they're trying to, you know, supplement. Well, um, well, I mean, listen, in, in, in their defense, they haven't gone through the trials and tribulations of your own health journey or had enough miles on their odometer of the sophistication, I guess you would call that wisdom of understanding that, okay, it's the glue that holds this together. It's not the parts. Anyways, Sean, I got to keep this for part two. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your time. We'll be in contact with each other so sure. that we get that part two going. I appreciate your time and I look forward to our, our next conversation. You too, Joel. Take care. Thanks. Take care.